Hey, what's going on? How you doing? I'm good. I, I, I love you coaches. You guys are always on time, like three minutes, four minutes early. So you're keeping up with uh, the theme of all the head coaches. You guys are always like right there. So uh, awesome to see. <laughs> How many guys have you done? Uh, we've had kind of uh, quite a few of the, the kind of this area. We had the Fordham coach came on, the Wagner coach, Hofstra, probably guys you all know. Uh, I know that uh, next week, uh, Bob Hirschfield, uh, he's coming on. So, uh, you know, I appreciate you guys coming on. Where, where, where do you live? Uh, I live down by the shore. I live in Eatontown. Okay. Everybody in your family is safe and healthy during this time? So far, I mean, we're going a little stir crazy, but... It's nice today, so I'm outside. Hopefully, I, my uh, Wi-Fi continues to work out here. Absolutely, yeah. Well, how long? Appreciate how long uh, do you know how long we're going to be? Just because I, I got a couple other things going on today, but I just wanted to just check. Uh, no more than like half hour, for, you know, forty five minutes at most. So okay. Just it's just me asking the question, so it, it doesn't go uh, it doesn't go that that far. Why don't we pick up where kind of uh, you. Uh, where you were when this whole news broke and were, were you hearing like kind of whispers that like the season was going to get canceled and, and was that a hard conversation to have with the guys? And some coaches said they didn't even have a conversation with the guys. Were you able to get a, a kind of last talk in with the guys? Uh, we did, but we didn't know it was, um, you know, we were, we were, we were on a bus flying to Florida mm. and then we were off the bus because we were told we couldn't fly. And then we were kind of in a pause mode. And then in the interim, because our trip to play Army, I think, was the, was the flight to Florida. And that got canceled uh, by our administration, just in conversations with people at higher levels. And so we, we picked East Carolina. I had somebody cancel with them. We picked up a weekend with them, like in five minutes. And we were getting ready to just take our bus that we already had down to East Carolina. And then... About two hours later, you know, we got an update that that wasn't going to happen. And then another two hours later, we got an update. You know, our guys were just hanging out. And uh, we met with them uh, in a media room and just told them, hey, um, we've been advised, you know, that uh, the spring recess is at least canceled. Um, maybe more, but right now that's what we're looking at. You know, go home, take your stuff. Uh, we want you out off campus and home right now and, and uh, try to be safe and we'll communicate further with you. So it, it was like we were in full game mode. Mm. And, and then like four hours later, we were we literally were getting in our vehicles and driving home. And wow. that, I've been in school twice since then um, just to you know, get permission to go in and get some some uh, supplies, some folders, some recruit stuff, some different things that we needed. Um, but other than that, we've been in touch with the guys, um, you know, through WebEx. Um, not as often as you would think, though, because, um, you know, they, they got classes, so we have a window to, to, to contact them. And then the week before final exams, you have to shut up all your communication down until after. So I think we now can get back in touch with them um, and, and check in with them, you know, a little bit more and kind of we're trying to give them updates, but there's no updates, you know. Mm -hmm. So right now the focus is them you know, finishing their schoolwork at a high level, staying healthy, um, keeping busy, having structure and discipline to their daily uh, activities, and then utilizing this time to become in great shape physically because, you know, everyone can get out and run, lift. Even if you don't have a gym, mm. uh, the coach has sent everyone um, four different versions of body weight exercises. We've already updated that twice. So we've been on that type of stuff. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, everybody's kind of main focus was the seniors. So I don't know how many seniors were uh, were, were on the Rutgers team this year. We had eight. Um, okay. And, you know, some of, uh, three or four of them are four, I think, are coming back and four mm. beyond. Um, so that was a process. That's the first thing we did, you know, about a week in was call all the seniors and say, if you were afforded another year of eligibility, would you come back? Um, and then the other part of that question was, you know, are you able to come back as a grad student? Because that's the only way that you could come back. Mm. And the third part was if you didn't get any money from the school, because we don't know what resources are available, would you still be able to come back or would you want to leave? And then, you know, then we took all that information and over the course of three or four weeks, um, you know, we were able to communicate with guys that could come back and that we had room for. Because that's, you know, that's a difficult, it's a whole different 
a scenario that we've never really encountered before having five years of kids in a four year roster. Mm. Yeah, this is uh, uh, crazy. This was your first year in Rutgers. Not exactly how, how you would have uh, drew it no, up, right? It didn't, <laughs> didn't get scripted out the, the, the way. But, you know, um, we've, uh, we went into this as a coaching staff. Um, it was a very busy year. And then, uh, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time recruiting. And we've done a, you know, I think we've had some successes over the course of the past two months. Put ourselves in a better situation than when we went in. And so we're just, we're just going to ride it out, stay busy and try to get better and learn more. We're, you know, doing some professional development uh, with other coaches, working on some projects, working, you know, on a lot of different things and, and staying quite busy. Awesome, man. Sounds like you guys have the right attitude. Well, why don't we back it up and why don't we, uh, why don't we go to your story, you know, where you grew up and, and was it, was it always baseball or did you play any other sports growing up? And, and what was it like, what did baseball mean to you at an early age? And was it love at first sight? Like you, lo- you, you loved baseball early on. I just loved it. I did love baseball. I loved it. I played everything. I mean, I grew up in a, in a small uh, rural upstate New York town. Mm. We didn't lock our doors. We kept our keys in our cars. Um, you know, everyone was in each other's houses, you know, when it got dark, that's when you came home. No one knew where your parents didn't know where you were. Mm-hmm. Didn't care. Uh, we were just playing, you know, we were playing outside all the time and stuff like that. So we played a lot of sports, uh, pickup sports. We played organized sports. My dad was the little league coach. Um, that was awesome because he knew a lot about baseball and sports in general and mm-hmm. he taught us. He also, you know, put a lot of pressure on us to be good. And, and I think that was helpful too. Um, and, uh, but he coached us all the way up through and, um, you know, I didn't have Pop Warner football in my town, so I didn't start playing football until seventh grade, uh, but we played basketball. <clears throat> so we played everything. In fact, in high school, um, you know, in, in middle school, I wrestled as well. Mm. Uh, but, but in high school, I played uh, football baseball or football, basketball, baseball. And then we also ran track. We only played high school baseball. We didn't have games on the weekends. Mm-hmm. So uh, uh, myself and one of my, my best friend went to the university of Notre Dame to play football. He was really mm-hmm. fast. And uh, we, we ran track during baseball season. One of the best things I ever did for me, because one of my best talents athletically was my speed. And that was enhanced by learning. I ran the hurdles and I did long jump and I ran sprints. So we would practice during high school study halls. So I played two varsity sports in the spring. Um, and so, you know, just pl- played baseball in the summer. As soon as school ball got over, we played, um, used to call it senior league when you were 13 to 15, mm. it was Legion baseball. And Legion baseball in my town was huge. It's like, it's, it's not comparable to the Cape Cod League, um, but it, it's similar. In Close, like, yeah. At the time, people older people would put their lawn they, they'd like drive over to the legion field at three in the afternoon to put their lawn chairs down because otherwise there was no bleachers but you'd have it was like it was like a town park mm. and a lot of people would come like when we played like smith post from rome or adrian post from utica um those were really good teams and there would be hundreds and hundreds of people and so it was, you know, it was high level competition and it was awesome because whether you won or lost, people cared about mm. and, and they were, they took pride in their, um, so that was our travel ball. Our travel ball was not, you know, was staying in our league on the days we didn't have games. We had practice, you know, every day, um, two or three hour practice, BP, infield, outfield, base running, ground balls, um, it, it was structured and it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. So, you know, that, that you can't, you, when you, when you have five or 600 people watching you play uh, a Legion baseball game, you got to be on top of your game. You don't want to stink out there. So it was, it was, it was, a, it was fun. You know, it makes you, um, you know, appreciate the game and, and play it at a high level and bring it every day. You couldn't just show up and not play. Um, we had a lot of good players too. So if you weren't any good, no, you know, you didn't play. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. You're putting a smile on a lot of people's face today, you know, with people going to the games, putting lawn chairs out and stuff like that. So you went to, to St. Lawrence, uh, right? 
And, and what was that like? Because I'm sure back then, I'm not calling you old or anything like that, because I've had people on here that were, you know, five years ago, the recruiting process was different. It was the, they, they didn't commit till senior year. What year, when did you commit to, to school? Huh. I don't know, January, my senior year. Maybe. Yeah, that's what. <laughs> so, you know, it was crazy. There was no recruiting. Yeah. You know? um, your high school coach might have known somebody that used to, he used to play with. Mm. Other kids from your high school, if they not a lot of kids from my high school went to college, but there was a couple wrestlers and a football player that went from my high school up to St. Lawrence, and you know I I visited there and I was recruited uh, by Andy Talley, who was my football coach who who went on to Villanova and won a national championship, mm. um, really outstanding coach, and then Tom Fay was my baseball coach up there, and you know. It was like, okay, this is cool. I got a good financial aid package. I can play two sports. Um, was you know, that key to? Was that key to, to yeah, play two sports? Yeah, I needed to play two sports. Okay. Um, I, I I had opportunities to go to other schools, uh, Ithaca College, and and like um, I was getting recruited for uh, football by Colgate. Uh, I don't think I got accepted there, uh, so that got that got put on the back burner. But then. Um, Lemoyne College, like if you were good in baseball in my area, you went to Ithaca, Lemoyne, or Mansfield at the time. Mm. Mansfield was a powerhouse Division II team with Harry Hilson coaching it. So it was, um, you know, everyone kind of went to the same places. And uh, I chose to go to St. Lawrence because I could play both. Um, and that's, I mean, that's, that's how I got there. I mean, I remember uh, the football coach called me and said, hey, you got accepted and uh, you got a good financial aid package, so are you coming? And I was like, uh, yeah, yeah, I think I'm coming. That's about, that's, that's what it was. So, and I did play two sports there. And uh, so that was, that was cool to be able to do that. And, uh, and then still get a chance to play professionally was cool too. That's awesome. So when you, I, I, you go on from college, you play some pro ball and um, was it always like, Hey, if this doesn't work out, cause everybody's dream when they play college baseball and then they play some pro ball, like I got to make it to the major league. Were you kind of like, when it was over, were you like, I'm going to coach or was that kind of like that the last thing you wanted to do to coach? Well, I wanted to get, I, I expected to get drafted my junior mm -hmm. year. I was having a great year and I hurt my thumb. And I don't think I got a hit for the last three weeks of the season. I couldn't throw accurately. Not that I could throw very accurately anyway, but um, I, I had lost the the ability to control the bat and the ball with my right thumb injury. And uh, people came in, cross checkers came in and, and a few scouts came in to see me late. And I, I just was not good enough uh, at that level. And so I didn't get drafted. And then I was really motivated my senior year and came back and had a very good year. And then I was hopeful to, you know, there wasn't that type of communication anymore. So a scout might have said, yeah, we think we're going to draft you, but you don't know for sure. Mm. And uh, so in the interim, I had graduated and I had a job as a phys ed teacher, I think in like Governor, New York or some, some small town. And, um, and then I got the call. Um, um, I don't remember, <laughs> you know, you had a home phone then. So I got a home phone. My mom got a call and said, hey, there was a scout. You just got drafted by a scout. <laughs> so... I went and bought like a $2,000 car, which is about all I had uh, in my signing bonus and started, you know, started to play. I was ac actually, my first year I got to play in the Penn League, which was great. Mm. You know, I was, that's all upstate New York towns. And so I was playing in front of people, friends and family all summer long. And we won a championship. We won a New York Penn League championship that year, which was fun too. That's awesome. And then you, um, you become an assistant at, at Ithaca, right? How did, how did that come about? Yeah. How did that job so, kind of come? Because well, I'm always fascinated with the six degrees of separation in baseball. Yeah, so I got done playing. My third year, I went to spring training. I got cut the last day of spring training. Mm. Stayed out in Arizona for a while um, with some, uh, some different people that had gone to St. Lawrence and were successful businessmen out there. Um, Came home. I remember my dad picked me up from the Utica airport, which doesn't even exist anymore. There, there's no airport there anymore. Um, you know, and, and I just remember, you know, looking at him and saying, well, this death, that was fun, but this is all done now. And so mm -hmm. um, I worked with him. Uh, he was a plumbing and heating contractor, self-employed. So I worked with him off and on my whole life, but I worked with him for that time. Uh, I fished a lot, hunted a lot of deer. Did, you know, I lived at home with my parents. Um, my brother was still playing pro baseball. We were playing at the same time. Uh, he was with the Phillies. And, and uh, so, um, you know, I, I didn't really know what I was going to do. And uh, 
then um, about a year later, um, I got engaged, or maybe I was engaged at that point. I can't remember. It was so long ago, but um, I had moved to Syracuse, and I was working as a uh, I was working at a, uh, a fitness center. I was selling fitness center memberships, and I wound up being the general manager of the place somehow hmm. for the course of six months. And there was turnover, and I was there, and I got a job, and so I was making quite a bit of money. And then I got a call in the winter from my old baseball coach uh, at St. Lawrence. And he said, mm. you have an opportunity to go coach football under Jim Butterfield and baseball under George Valcente at Ithaca and get your master's degree and then start coaching. And you should go do that. So I did. That's awesome. I just rolled down there in the fall um, and started, uh, you know, started uh, coaching and, uh, and teaching and learning and, and that's how I got into coaching. You know, there wasn't a master plan for me to coach. I just, I loved it. Um, it was exciting. It was a way to stay involved. And, uh, and then that summer, I had taken a job with Tom Ford at Cornell to be his assistant coach. Hmm. Graduated with my master's degree. I did it in a little over nine months. And in the interim, the Cortland uh, head baseball job had opened up 30 miles up the road. And I went in and applied and had an interview with the athletic director, Lee Roberts, and, uh, and he hired me. Wow. So I, I went from, you know, in a, in a course of 12 months, I coached two sports, got offered an assistant job at Cornell, and then had a head job at a Division three school. And so it was kind of – it wasn't, it wasn't a very high pay. I remember uh, – I think, I don't know if it was 11700 or $13,100, but that's what I made. And um, I, I had to, I still built houses in the summer for a contractor and worked every camp that I could. And then I also worked part-time as a fitness center uh, because I didn't have enough money just coaching. So I, I had three jobs. That is, that, that's amazing, man. That's, uh, that's, that's great. I knew there was obviously a story behind it, but I mean, I would ask you kind of what was the biggest difference from you from going from an assistant to being a head coach, but it seems like you didn't even have really much of an assistant under your, your belt, really. I didn't. I, you know, and um, those are things that can help you because you just got thrown in the pool and you got to mm. learn to swim. Um, and it can also, it can also hurt you because part of, of coaching is learning and being tutored. Um, so, but I, I felt like, you know, I had quality coaches in college. I had a great coach growing up, you know, with my dad coaching us all the way up through. Uh, I understood the game. I had the motivation. And then when I went to Ithaca, that was an important year because uh, Jim Butterfield is, is a legendary football coach. Mm. Um, and I don't know if anyone in this part of the country knows about him or not, but he won, you know, national championships. Um, he's, he was so far ahead of his time. And he taught me so much about how to coach, um, you know, how to design a practice that was exciting and short and to the point. We never conditioned. I was blown away. We, we, uh, I'm coaching the football team and practice is over like in an hour and 45 minutes. And you're like, wow, that was, I want to keep going. And we accomplished the objectives every day. He was so organized. He put together practice plans that were so clear and executed at a high level and simple. And instead of a four hour practice that drives drags on forever and there was no conditioning, like you didn't stop and do conditioning at. So I learned a lot of important things from coaching football. Um, mm. and, and I love coaching football. My wife says all the time, you know, you should have coached football because <laughs> money. <laughs> um, but, uh, and then, you know, I went right into baseball and that was another great experience, um, under that coaching staff. And, um, uh, and then, so I learned a lot in a short period of time, you know, I learned a lot. Um, and cause I worked under high level programs under really established veteran, great coaches. And then I, I put that stuff into my own formula and just hit the ground running. And what about also having different, um, assistants like at, at uh, Cortland, like what type of assistants did you put guys you knew, or did they kind of put guys for you? How did that work in, in forming? I your mean, staff? I didn't have any money. You know? Yeah. Um, so um, I had, uh, I had multiple assistants at Cortland, but, um, I had, uh, 
an, an older guy that had coached at Ithaca named Pat Courtney, um, mm. who, who was a school teacher. I had Matt Ellison, who was from California. His wife, I think, taught at Cornell. Um, he helped me out. And then I had Joe Brown. And Joe Brown is still the head coach at Cortland. And he might be the winningest coach, baseball coach of all time. I mean, his mm. percentage is like 800. So after my eight years there, he took over the program when I moved on. And he's just, you know, hit the ground running and done a super job with that forever. So I, had, yeah. I didn't have that much turnover in my, in my assistant coaches, quite, quite honestly. Um, Joe was with me throughout the whole thing. It's funny. So he had a summer job coaching in the New York Collegiate Baseball League. So he worked for me during the school year. And then in the summer, I was his assistant coach. <laughs> That's funny. I'm sure you had some, some fun going back and forth with him, telling him what to do. Yeah, we had, we had some fun. Was it tough to leave there after eight years, or was it kind of you knew it was time to move on and go on to yeah, something I mean, else? We, another... had, we, had gone, we had gone to the World Series five years in a row. Yes, yeah. Um, had built the program up, you know, really high level. And, but, but Lemoyne was the staple of baseball in upstate New York, you know, Division I program in the, in the Metro Atlantic Conference, uh, tons of pro players, tons mm. of leaguers. You know, it was like that was the prestigious job. I didn't I had only had to move 45 minutes and I was um, the, the athletic director. Dick Rockwell was the former uh, baseball coach there who was a legendary successful coach. Um, he was a former pro player, former pro manager, um, just a baseball guy throughout, knew everyone in the country. And uh, so when he called me and said, I want you to be my baseball coach, you know, you, you didn't say no to him. Mm. Um, he said, well, like, can I get a little bit more money than I'm making now? And he goes, yeah, we can probably work that out. <laughs> and then I put my house, I put a for sale sign in my uh, house the day that he called me. So, but it's always difficult to leave, you know? Mm. Um, so, but, you know, it was exciting and I, I had to go up there. Coaching changes are usually made when things aren't going at this, at the level that you would want them to go at. So that program was down just a little bit when I got there and it was a, very challenging, you know, rebuild. So I just hit the ground and started working and, and, you know, that went out, that turned out okay. And how were those two schools different, you know, Cortland and Lemoyne, how were they different, uh, well, different coaching? Cortland, uh, I recruited very locally and I had some mm. squads. When I got to Lemoyne, I had scholarships for the first time. Not a lot. I think I had like six at the time, five or six, but um, I had to learn how I had to, you know, and then there was compliance. Um, it was a lot, it was a lot different. And we were playing, you know, we were now playing division one, you know, big schools as well as mm -hmm. schools in our conference. And um, I also, in addition to being the head baseball coach there, I had another full-time position. So I was 50% baseball coach and I was 50% assistant AD. I was in charge of all the work study students, all the game administration for every single outdoor and indoor sport, paying the officials, um, scheduling the building supervision. I, I literally worked in the building till 10 o'clock every night mm. and on, the, on the weekends, Saturdays and Sundays. And, and, you know, while I was working all those hours, I was recruiting players. And, um, and so we recruited some good players and got things rolling there. And, and uh, that was a lot of fun. Mm. And uh, you were there for like 10 years, so we don't need to go through everything. That's that's why I know we said it a half hour on this thing, but you, you've been at places for like 10 years. It seems like you're at 10 years and it, you, you have a great track record. So that's you leave there. The, 10 years is the eight to 10 has been like, yeah. and, and that's not because I was looking for another job. It was because I really, I put everything that I had into every mm. place that I've been. And then it was time to move on for a new challenge. That's that. That's so true. So then you get, how does the Bryant job come to you? And that's now, now we're moving up. I mean, people watching this, you're, you're hearing Bryant and, and we know that today they're, they're a powerhouse. Like you build that program up. So at the time, what was Bryant's program like? And, and was that a no brainer to leave? Well, Jamie Penzino uh, had, had been at the Bryant position for, you know, seven or eight years. And then when that position opened up, they had, they had been very successful the year before, um, and uh, they were in the Division Two to Division One transformation. So um, we, when I took that position, I could not. I, I could play in the conference as a Division One school, but 
but I I don't think I could be eligible for a postseason tournament or an NCAA tournament for three years. Mm -hmm. So it, that's not an ideal job, right? Um, yeah, no. A lot of games at Lemoyne and went to a lot of NCAA tournaments, and then I had to take a a, a, a fixer upper job, you know, three hundred miles away in a part of the country that I didn't know anybody. Um, but it was it was um, my Dick Rockwell had retired. Uh, the Metro Athletic Conference had kicked us out of the conference because we won it too many times, and we were an associate <laughs> member. Um, so I played independently. My last two years coaching baseball at Lemoyne, we were we were an independent Division One program, and that's not where you want to be. Uh, so at that time, I was looking for other opportunities. And then Bill Smith, who's from Auburn, New York, um, uh, was the athletic director at Bryant. And I remember I emailed him and he called me back and we met in Skinny Atlas Lake for uh, dinner with him and his wife. And uh, I went to campus for an interview, met with him and the president and got hired. And, and so I went home and, and my wife knew that we were going to be, we had a nice place in Syracuse too. We had a lot of friends, our kids were young. Um, so she, I don't know if she was happy or not happy about that, but um, it, it worked out right. I said, hey, trust me, this is going to be great. You know, really beautiful school. Uh, new challenge for us. Um, let's get the house fixed up and sell it, and I'm going to start working. So I'll see you on the weekends. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first time life was really going to change, and like your head coaching, you know, you moved yeah. 45 minutes, and this right. was the time like you were moving into a different area. That I mean, it, you know, it's it's close enough, but it's it's different. You know, it's, it's like is that a, yeah, it, it was a true life change. Like because we weren't, we couldn't, you know, I couldn't shoot home, see my dad, see my mom, see my brother, you mm -hmm. know. Um, you know, all, all, everything was going to be different. Our friends were going to change and, and where we were settling was going to change. Um, oddly enough, one of my best friends I coached football with lived in Massachusetts up in Boston. Uh, he was a, a state trooper. And uh, so I did have a good friend, you know, in, in New England. But other than that, I didn't know anybody. You mm. know, just a few, a few people here and there. And uh, so I took that job. Um, I lived in a townhouse for the whole summer with no air conditioning, which was miserable. And I went to work, you know. Um, and uh, then I, I hired my first assistant there, Ryan Facto. Um, and we started, you know, recruiting players. And, and it, you know, we were pretty good the first year. The second year, we won the league and we mm -hmm. couldn't go anywhere. And then the third year, we won, you know, like, I don't know, 45 games. And we were, we won a game in a regional against Arkansas that year at Kansas State. So it, it, it like year three was the magical year for us to be ready. So it was great. Um, the Cortland was a big school and a state school. Um, Lemoyne was the little small private school. Mm -hmm. And Bryant was in between, you know, like 4,000 kids, private school. And um, how did the recruiting change too, Nick? Because now maybe you were getting people not from just locally. Like what right. was the recruiting like at Bryant? It was a little challenging at first because there's a, there's a ton of schools in New England, just like yes. New Jersey, but a lot of schools in New England, um, you know, including Boston College, Northeastern, um, and, and uh, UConn. Um, so, you know, some really good baseball programs and stuff. And, and, uh, and we had to find, a, find the right kids, high academic kids. It was expensive school. We, we got a formula going. We picked the right kids, and we, we started to get some very successful kids. And then all of a sudden, as soon as we started winning at the level that we were winning, it was, became much easier to recruit. We were getting guys drafted every year. Um, it just – and then we, we won the league, you know, I think nine years in a row, the regular season. Um, and it was, it was wonderful. I made uh, lifelong friends. Um, it's a tremendous school with great leadership from the president uh, all the way down. You know, the athletic director was awesome to me. Um, and, and uh, you know, the, the facilities really got it. Mm. And, and that helped us, too. I mean, Bill Connedy. Uh, who's a very successful businessman, uh, an alumni of the program, pretty much took ownership of our program. And he helped us uh, build a stadium. And then he helped us build uh, an indoor center. And our facilities became very, very good. But we earned them. And, and he, he bought them. And then 
you know, things took off and it was a great formula. So I, I still keep in touch with all those people. That was a difficult um, place to leave because I had a wonderful house. I had a wonderful job. Uh, it was just, you know, every, there was no reason for me to leave other than. Yeah. You could have been there 30, 30 years, you know, yeah, could have been, yeah. I, I could have. Um, I just felt like I had, I had made my mark on that place. Um, I had done everything that I possibly could do. Mm. And I felt that it was um, when this position opened up, it was an opportunity. I, I had been looking for an opportunity potentially to get in a power five conference and stay in the Northeast. Mm. And, you know, that doesn't happen too often. So, it was something that I um, was very interested in. So then, no no brainer then to take the Rutgers job. You throw your you throw your name out there and uh, see what happens. So it was a no brainer when they came to you for the job. Yeah, I mean, I turned down. You know, I turned a lot of jobs down. I got a lot of, you know, I won a lot of games at Lemoyne, and and nobody seemed to pay attention to that. And then when mm. I went one time, I went to the Boston area, and we won a lot of games. All of a sudden, you know, we were, <laughs> um, and we got some, you know, got some attention and. We were able to move some assistant coaches on to really good programs. And then, you know, I had several um, very interesting job opportunities over the course of my time at Bryant. Um, some I didn't get and some I was offered and it just wasn't like, why would I leave, you know, a mid-major program that's already doing outstanding to go to another, mm -hmm. it had to be the right place for me to leave there. You know, it was a win-win. And so Rutgers, right? So now you're at Rutgers and now it's obviously, I mean, is there any pressure playing in such a, uh, you know, kind of known conference? Is there any pressure going into this year? Yeah, there's pressure. I mean, you know, you're in a power five conference, you got to win. You got to have a high level program. Um, you have to earn your resources. You have to keep developing, you know, not only your talent base, but your, um, you know, and, and win, wins and losses, but um, very, very, um, you know, uh, a lot of time spent with planning and trying to, you know, connect with alumni and fundraising and marketing and, um, you know, and, and building facilities, which is, that's our biggest, you know, hurdle right now because, you know, from a player welfare standpoint and taking care of our, our guys, it's a great school. We have tons of resources for them mm. academically, in the weight room, nutrition wise, um, with how we schedule classes so that there's very minimal uh, conflicts. Um, you know, the, the amount of money that we are in our budget to support them, the level of playing, um, how we travel is first class, like just there's a lot of great things. But you know, with that comes the, the expectation to continue to grow things and, and, and to win and have a high level program. Absolutely. Cause we saw a couple of years ago, about a decade ago when Rutgers football was kind of uh, doing some good things. Like Rutgers is a very proud school. If you, if you do well at Rutgers, like a lot of fans come out alumni. So it's, uh, it's, it would be really great to see Rutgers baseball program kind of get, uh, kind of get a redo. And it seems like you're, you're the guy for the job. So um, at Rutgers, what is the recruiting now like? Because now it's like, are you just looking New Jersey? Or are you going outside that box? Or are you going West Coast? What is the recruiting like? Well, you know, everywhere I've been, you don't lose your roots like where you were. Mm. So I, I can recruit Buffalo to Albany, to Watertown, to Elmira, and, you know, and Long Island, and New England. And, and those are all places that I've been. And I've been in New Jersey a ton, too. I brought a lot of Jersey kids up to Lemoyne, and I had some really good North Jersey kids and South Jersey kids at Bryant. So it's not like, you know, we didn't, we didn't use New Jersey. Um, we focused on our home area. You know, I focused on Massachusetts and Connecticut, and I still went back to upstate New York and got some good players, some elite players. So we will continue to, to utilize all of our resources to recruit everywhere in the Northeast because I feel we can and be an attractive option for all of those states. However, it is my goal um, to, to make at least half and maybe 75% of our rosters, if we can get the right kids from the state of New Jersey, because it mm. don't make sense. It makes sense from every single standpoint. So um, that's the goal right now. And, and we're, we're starting to make progress in that. It's not an overnight fix. Uh, it's a process. Uh, we're committed to it. And, um, you know, I feel like we've made a lot of progress in the last eight months 
you're talking about like a Jersey kid saying like, oh, I don't want to look at the Jersey school or whatever. I'd rather go down South. You want them to say, no, I want to go to Rutgers and play baseball there. hundred percent. You know, um, a lot of them are still going to go down South, just like New Jersey. I mean, they have great uh, student athletes. We have 9 million people in the state. We have great athletes in every sport, whether it's women's soccer or volleyball or football and basketball. I mean, great, great, great athletes. Um, we're not going to get them all. We don't need them all. Mm-hmm. The right ones. And uh, we do need, you know, we're not going to settle. We need high level players that want to be here and, um, and, and they need to believe in us and believe in the process and want to be at Rutgers and understand what a great school this is, uh, how much fun it can be and what a conference we play in. You know, why would you want to go down South when we, we can, we're playing in the big 10, one of the mm-hmm. great conferences in the whole country you know, football, baseball, all the sports, um, and, and high academics and tremendous alumni bases so that when you're done graduating, you have 500,000 alumni of Rutgers University. One of those dudes is going to hire you, you know, Mm. um, and and the cost, you know, it's, it's very, very inexpensive and it's high level, uh, academics as well. Uh, That's one of the things that surprised me was, you know, that I think that the incoming SAT score, uh, it's like 1340 or 1350, really, really high academics, um, which I didn't have that perception you know, mm. up in New England of Rutgers. And, and it's, it's also, I feel like a really exciting time, aside from the pandemic, which has been miserable for everyone and every, yeah. you know, every single person has been affected. Um, and, you know, no one asked for it, but we got to deal with it. Um, but, you know, with what, uh, you know, women's basketball team and the women's yes. soccer team and the field hockey team and, um, and the, and the men's basketball team has done. And then coach Chiano coming in and, you know, I'm still getting to meet all the head coaches cause we all, we all go to work and do our own thing. And there's not as much inter, you know, mingling as, as there is, as there is in smaller places. But uh, I think that, you know, um, administ- that the administ- we have a new president, um, you know, come from Northwestern, exciting guy, mm. you know, was a former um, football player, I believe. And, uh, and Pat Hobbs is, you know, continuous fight for, you know, to, to try to elevate things. And, um, and then being around all these other great coaches and then, you know, the excitement of Coach Ciano coming in and, and, you know, really killing it on the recruiting trail and just going to the basketball games and seeing that there's, 10,000, you know, you, there's not one chair open for, for every basketball game and we're winning. Um, that's, uh, that's really a great time to be here and to try to build for all of us to try to build our programs around that momentum. Yeah. This way Rutgers probably would have made the, the tournament this year for basketball. So no, no doubt. And they were fun to watch. Um, you know, they were really fun to watch. I went to every game and the rest of the program. I mean, you know, and, and men in the, the, the lacrosse programs and the swimming program, I mean, every, it's a, there's a lot of good stuff happening. You know, I, I think people are starting to pay attention. And like you said, in New Jersey, if, if you can win and you can build a great product, people will come and support. Yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah. New Jersey, if you, if you do well at Rutgers, people will definitely come. So what is your prototypical, like when you're recruiting a Rutgers baseball player, what type of like, what are you looking for in a Rutgers baseball player? Well, I, that's hard to say because every position is different. Every need is different. Um, it's very targeted, very specific. But, you know, we're looking for very athletic kids uh, who have a high ceiling for development because that's been one of our um, – one of the things we've been able to do, you know, with my coaches who work so hard, my assistant coaches that have been so talented everywhere I've been, along with just the drive that we try to, you know, to, to show from the top down is that we can take a player and really develop them. Mm. Uh, so we don't want to start, you know, with a really low level player and ha- and develop them into a solid player. We want to start now with a, I have to start with a really high product and then we got to get them to a pro caliber type player, you know? So we're looking for big, strong, athletic, physical kids that, that you know are athletic and they move well and you can teach them and they're receptive and they're tough nosed they want to win and they and they'll buy into what it takes and they'll accept criticism um and they're self-motivated and there's a lot of you know 
there's not there's not one thing you can't just say yeah I'm looking for this in a player yeah so there's there's a lot of things we're looking for in players you know and and then each year we take our group of players that we have um, and we try to build our philosophy for how we're going to win that year and it's different you know you might have to play great defense and mm. You might have power pitching that strikes out a lot of guys and you don't have to play as great a defense because the ball's not in play and you can try to score more runs. You can try to whack the ball over the fence if you got those type of guys. If not, you got to have high on base percentage, bat handlers, guys that don't strike out. It, the, the strategy changes every year. And until we can become an elite program where we can just pick and choose who we want, we have to kind of uh, – we have to – develop what we have and then what we get and, and try to win with it, you know? So it's a process. Awesome. And how has the like recruiting game, you know, I know it could be a long answer, but uh, changed from, from when you first started in 1990 to all the way now, you know, 2020. I mean, it's, it's crazy to think where we came. Most of the kid that I got when I was at Cortland, I got in three counties in upstate New York. <laughs> I found the best players. I got them. And that's, that's it. Like, I, yeah. I don't want to hear a kid from Long Island or this or that or whatever. I just, I just took, then at, um, at Lemoyne, it changed. We were doing official visits, you know, with seniors, entertaining kids, bringing their parents out to dinner, uh, putting them up in a hotel. And then we would ask the kid for a commitment, you know, after we did that. But it was senior year. Very rarely did we give a commitment ever earlier than that. It just didn't happen. You watched mm -hmm. junior summer and made your – and I, I, if we can go back to watching junior summer before everyone made their decisions on kids, um, that would be, I think if you asked every coach in the country, they'd be like, yeah, that would be great. But it's not the, not the reality. Mm. Now there's tons of social media. And at Bryant, it was so competitive. We, for us to get really high level of players, we had to get some of them early. Mm. So once we got a good program going, we were able to be attractive to some kids early. And, and being a mid-major, sometimes we had to overpay for a kid that, you know, could go to an ACC school for less money. Um, and now it's totally different. You know, we're competing with, um, you know, just about every school in the country. Yeah. Because they all come to New Jersey and look for athletes. Um, Southern schools, you know, a lot of ACC schools, you know, some SEC schools are still recruiting up here. Um, so everyone's you know, plucking away some kids. And so it's, it's, it's quite challenging, but it's also, you know, fun. And, and I feel like as a power five school, we have some, we, we get things going, we have some pull and we can attract, be very attractive to some of these high level kids. Um, you know, not only right now, but going forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I've also been told that you're a big, uh, big Dean Marini bat fan. Bill McDermott told me you, you like Dean Marini. If it was a perfect world, you would like Rutgers to be swinging Dean Marini. Is that true? Well, we, I mean, my whole um, career, I've been kind of, you know, with, with uh, Wilson, I was at, Wil I was with Wilson all the way up through. And so we've been able to maintain that here. And, and yes, you know, those are, it's been a company that I've been with for a long time and, and um, they've been, you know, very loyal and they've been great to me, even though I've been in small places, they've been great. And I feel like, you know, we've provided them um, uh, a good, you know, a good product each year too, to be able to say that we're affiliated with them. Yes. Awesome. All right. So if Bill's watching this, you know, uh, maintain that good relationship. That's what we, that's what we'll say. Yeah, to we're, we're, we're ready. And Bill's an alum too, so there's no excuse then, you know. No, there's no excuse, and and uh, uh, yeah, and unfortunately, you know, this year we didn't get a chance to spend too much time with him, and and uh, um, you know, I'm sure that'll change going forward because I'm planning on being here for a long time. Absolutely. So, Coach, uh, last question, then we'll let you get on with your day. Um, if they make a movie about you, what actor is going to be playing you? I don't know. Um, I should know the answer to this too, because I've watched a lot of more TV in the last month than I have in my whole <laughs> life. Um, I don't know. I mean, it depends on the movie probably, but I, uh, people tell me, you know, that I used to look like Roger Craig, mm. who used to be an ESPN football guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's not, 
he's not an actor. So, um, I don't know, maybe, um, maybe Robert De Niro in one of his miserable, when, when he's, when he's uh, playing somebody miserable, because that's the perception, but that's really not the reality. Um, so, I don't know. That's is there, is, is there still a little uh, football coach in you? Like, you know, baseball or football? Love, listen, I love football and I love basketball. I love sports. Um, yeah. And, and I, I, you know, I love going to football games in the fall. And that's, that was another part of, of, of my high interest of, of coming here was throughout my entire 30 year professional life. I've never really, um, uh, been able to be part of such a large campus mm. setting you know where you go up you got to get there at 10 o'clock in the morning for a football game with 55,000 people and people are just it's just cool to see everyone tailgating and and uh you know wearing the colors and the trademarks and um just all the fanfare that goes with it and the fun uh it gives you a lot of school spirit and and I've never you know I've always had other sports that where I've been, but it hasn't been at this level. Mm. So watch, you know, to watch uh, the wrestlers wrestle Penn State and, and the women's volleyball players play Penn State and, and you know, the basketball team playing Indiana and, and, and Maryland and Michigan State and the football team playing Ohio State, Michigan. Those are really cool things for a fan. Um, and so, you know, I'm a big fan of all those sports and uh, I'll – you know, I'll be, I'll be the biggest fan um, for all those coaches and all those sports going forward. Um, and then, you know, likewise, we want people to get behind our baseball program because that's what I'm here for. I'm not here to be a fan. I'm here to do my job and, and, uh, and try to have a really high level um, baseball program that people are proud of. And, um, and I feel that that's going to happen. Awesome, man. Well, you got a fan here in the Northeast. So if you're ever in the area, if you're ever in Bergen County, New Jersey, that's where we're located. Stop in. I'd, I'd love to meet you face to face. So, I'm down the shore right now, and I, I don't just. I'm not gonna hang yeah. out in Bergen a little bit longer until things <laughs> get a little bit better up there. Uh, absolutely. I don't think I'm going down the shore. I, I'm not going down the shore, so you don't have to worry about uh, about me coming down there. But uh, we wish you luck and, and stay safe and healthy, and, and good luck in the future, Coach. Thanks for coming on. Okay. No problem. Thanks a lot.